Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jim Thurston and I am the current president elect of the Society for Radiological Protection. I'd like to welcome you to this lunchtime webinar in partnership with AURPO on radioactive decay calculations. So just before we start, um, just one or two uh, points to make. And the slide should move forward any moment now. There we are. Um, as a mark of the popularity of these webinars, it's uh, useful to point out that over 270 people have registered for this webinar. I think that's a, a fantastic uh, uh, turnout and it does show that we are embracing this new normal. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Charlene. Um, we will have an opportunity at the end of the presentation for questions that are asked to be answered by the speaker. So please use the Q&A box, which you will find it a, a, looks like a couple of square speech bubbles on the uh, bar with a question mark. If you click on there, you will be able to submit a question through that box uh, by typing it. Uh, those that are most liked will be answered at the end and others will be answered after the webinar and added into the past event page on SRP's website. Also at the end, please, can you give us your feedback? It's essential that we really do get a feel for how well these webinars are working and, and perhaps what we can do better with them. So please, uh, you receive an email of a survey to be uh, filled in online um, after the webinar is finished. Uh, one other thing you'll see in the QA box uh, is there is a code to you. So if you want to claim CPD for your attendance on this webinar, you can use the uh, code which is in the uh, Q&A box. Send that code to Charlene uh, at SRP and uh, she will send you an attendance uh, proof. So I think that's all I have to say, except that there are future events um, and I draw your attention to the uh, all day event on the 11th of November on recovery and remediation. Um, and also to point out that we do have more of these one hour webinars in the pipeline. So do look out for those. Also, if you yourself have any suggestions for further webinars, please do get in contact with us using that admin uh, email address. So without further ado, do, I will please hand over to AURPO President Professor Peter Cole, who's going to introduce our speaker for today. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. I uh, hope everybody can hear me. I've been having a few sound problems. Um, it gives me great pleasure to say once again that AURPO and SRP are collaborating in bringing you this next webinar in this series of webinars that we've produced. Uh, I believe that these webinars uh, have been tremendous help in these difficult times for our respective memberships, uh, of course, but also to the wider radiation protection community, both nationally in the UK, but also internationally around the world. What I'd like to do just before I uh, introduce today's speaker is just highlight uh, a new document which has come out of ERPA, which has been published by ERPA uh, in the last week. If I can put that one on, please, Charlene. And this, this document, which I had a little bit of a hand in producing, is entitled Practical Guidance for Engagement with the Public on Radiation and Risk. Uh, I, in public engagement is a vitally important aspect of radiation protection. And this document aims uh, are, are twofold. Uh, one is to encourage the radiation protection professionals around the world and the urban associated societies to engage with public, whatever that means. Well, it means non-expert. Uh, people who are not experts in radiation protection, and there's a whole range of, of different people, um, but also to offer some advice and uh, practical tips on actually how to do that engagement. Uh, there are various examples used within the document from various different sectors, nuclear, medical, etc., etc. Uh, I think every radiation protection professional should have a, a read of that document, and it's downloadable uh, for free from the ERPA web page uh, and the address is there. So without any further ado, I shall introduce today's speaker, 
It was my old friend and colleague, Dr. Chris Murdoch from Peak RPA Limited. Chris is a certificated radiation protection advisor and radioactive waste advisor with more than 20 years experience in this field. Chris originally specialised in environmental radioactivity and is based doing postdoctoral research looking at the use of uranium 288 decay series and Chernobyl derived radionuclides as traces for environmental processes. These research applications have been truly invaluable to Chris as he stepped into the world of radiation protection. On a personal note, I have worked with Chris for at least 10 years, probably more, and on many occasions he has been my salvation with a tricky calculation from which you can surmise that my skills with poetry are far greater than my skills with differential calculus. So, over to you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Share my screen. So, everybody should see, uh, should be able to see that screen. Is that it's coming through to you, Kate? Yeah? Yeah. OK, excellent. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Pete, for that um, uh, introduction. A little bit overzealous on my um, understanding of radioactive decay uh, equations, but I'm glad to have helped over the years. Um, as Jim uh, mentioned, there's more than 270 people um, registered to watch this webinar, which is a, an amazing number given the long title of the, of, the, of, the, of the talk, radioactive decay calculations, the mystery of the Bateman equation and how decay equilibria can affect our day-to-day -day work with ionising radiation. What a title. You could tell I'm a consultant. Why use three words when 50 will do? That's, uh, that's a mantra that we use it, uh, you know, within our field. Um, as Pete said, before I became an RPA, my background is um, or was um, in, in um, environmental radioactivity, uranium decay series. If I turn my webcam off, by the way. No, I have now. Uh, my background is in, in, in environmental radioactivity, particularly the use of uranium decay series nuclides. And um, th they've been particular, they are particularly useful in, in tracing environmental processes or being used as, as, as traces of environmental processes. So if we look at within this webinar, we're going to we'll focus in on, on on uranium decay series in particular. But if you think about the uranium decay chain, you've got radionuclides that have got million year, millions and millions of years half lives right the way down to seconds or microsecond half lives. And that that decay chain is extremely useful in, um, in, in tracing processes that might occur in the atmosphere, for example, on a on a, um, an hourly or a daily basis, so you can use uh, nuclides like bismuth 210 to to look at the, um, uh, the 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 air mass trajectory across local um, atmospheric um, distances. You can also use nuclides like lead 210, which has got a, a 20 plus year half life, to trace environmental processes in the in the aquatic or marine um, sedimentary environments, which is also extremely useful as a nuclide and then you step up to the big long-lived nuclides uranium-238, uranium-234, thorium-230 who have got all of which have got half-lives of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions or if not billions of years in which case they, they, they are extremely useful in tracing environmental processes in uh, geological systems that might occur over millions and millions of years. So you can't do that work, you can't do that research without having a, a reasonably good understanding of the mathematical me mathematical methods used to um, assess decay chain equilibria and decay calculations. So I was asked by SRP really to not, not so much to focus on the environmental stuff, but 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 to use the, um, the, the decay chain calculations um, and explain uh, you know, from first principles how they affect radiation protection and environmental protection fields. So that's where we got to um, and why I was asked to, to, to do this uh, to do this talk. As Jim said, welcome questions, um, which I'll try my best to answer at the end, uh, the end of this uh, the session. So without any further ado, let's let's crack on. Um, 
So the summary of what we're going to be looking at today, uh, I'm going to start off looking at the or explaining the fundamental law of radioactive de decay as, as RPA, as many of you, many of you are, I'm sure that'll be ingrained in, you know, we all, we, we, you know, it's one of the first things we, we learn as, as radiation protection professionals. But at, at the application of that radioactive decay uh, law to different states of equilibrium is something that perhaps not all of us have to think about on a daily daily basis. So I want to talk to you about secular and transient equilibrium, and then that naturally follows on to this equilibrium as well, this equilibria, uh, uh, you know, within uh, decay chains in particular. I want to, uh, as the title suggests, I do need to talk about the Bateman, Bateman equation and the application of the Bateman equation, which can be pretty complex. Uh, so I'll, I'll explain that as best I can and, and how it's used in long decay chain calculations. And then, uh, then we'll finish off with the, well, the, the second half of the of the webinar. We'll be uh, using examples of equilibrium states within decay chains and how they affect our work, perhaps on a day to day basis in radiation and environmental protection. So that's the scope of today's uh, session. I'll, I'll also throw in a, um, some of the stuff that is more background information for you than anything else, but how we use these nuclides as traces of environmental processes. OK, right. So starting off, fundamental law of radioactivity. Well, when a large number of radioactive atoms, M, N is subject to a probability that any of those particular atoms will disintegrate then um, in, in a unit time, then the probability of that disintegration is, of course, modelled with the decay constant lambda. OK, this is just starting from first principles. Uh, we can we can estimate uh, the total numbers of the or, or we can we can model the total numbers of disintegrations with uh, per unit time with uh, n lambda, where n is the number of atoms, and the rate of depletion of those atoms dn by t, t uh, over time dn by t t is equal to the activity of the, that radionuclide. Okay, a, but that only applies when there's no new supply of atoms into that box model. OK, when there's no new supply, N decreases uh, with increasing time. Following this function, dN by dt equals minus N lambda, which is, of course, the activity of the radionuclide in particular that, that, uh, that we're studying. OK, if lambda is regarded as time independent, then the solution of this equation is, of course, the classic decay equation that we all know, which is n, the number of atoms at time t, equals the number of atoms at time naught, times the exponential to the power of minus lambda t, where, of course, lambda is the decay constant, where n naught is the initial number of atoms at time t equals naught. So, Lambda is the log, natural log of two over the half-life of the radionuclide that we are studying. OK, so sh shorten that down to 0.693 over the, over the half-life. Of course, when we're, when we're determining lambda, particularly over, I'm jumping ahead a little bit now, but particularly over long decay chains, we need to make sure carefully that we, we always use the same unit for lambda. So, um, we, so when we when we're looking at lambda for a for a radionuclide with a few seconds half life, of course, you know that's that's um, seconds to the minus one. But but we need to make sure when we're determining lambda for long lived nuclides such as uranium two three eight that we convert our our um, years our billion year half lives into seconds so that we can then determine the the, the lambda value in seconds to the minus one. Lambda is the sum of the decay constants for all competing modes of decay. So I've given an example here on the slide of zinc 65, which decays via um, sort of three competing modes. You've got uh, electron capture and uh, beta plus decay. Um, so the lambda value for zinc 65 is, as it says above, the sum of the, all of the decay constants for those competing modes. OK. As n naught lambda is the activity of atoms um, remaining at time t equals naught, we can rewrite this equation to make this activity the subject. And this is the classic decay 
equation that we're all familiar with. Activity of a nuclide at time t equals the activity at time naught e to the minus lambda t. OK. And that's applicable universally to all radionuclides. And I'll probably interchange it between disintegration law or decay law as we progress today's talk. I'm not, I tend to normally use decay law. Lambda has a huge range of, uh, in, in sort of natural systems, but a huge range across all the radionuclides that are out there. As an example here, I've given um, polonium 212, sorry, uh, yeah, polonium 212 up to um, thorium 232. Polonium 212 has got a half life of 0.3 microseconds, which I always find fascinating to, under, to, you know, to even comprehend the shortness of that time scale and how somebody determined, how scientists determine that, you know, that, that half life. It's a phenomenally uh, um, short period of time. And then thorium 232 has got a half life of more than 14 billion years, which means the age of the Earth is what, uh, 4.7 billion years. We're not even half a half life into the thorium-232 decay. That's a range of 24 orders of magnitude, which is absolutely massive, massive range. Lambdas, um, this is what makes radioactivity so fascinating in, in many ways, that, that, that the, the decay constant for a radionuclide is independent of all physical chemical conditions. You can heat a, radion a radionuclide up to a million degrees and you will not alter its decay. Now, um, I'm not a, um, a, a material physicist uh, and, and so it's possible. I don't know whether whether you can at, at extremely high, um, extremely high temperatures have some influence on radioactive decay, but it's my understanding that you can't. Similarly, you can um, inflict immense pressures on, on a radionuclide and you won't alter that decay probability. Or through, and also through chemical condition change as well. But there is an exception to that, and there may be more than this, but certainly when I was doing my atmospheric research way back when, we studied beryllium-7, which is a, a radionuclide, which is a, a cosmic ray spallation product um, in the upper atmosphere. It's, it's, caused, it's, so it's, it's produced by cosmic ray interaction of oxygen and nitrogen in the upper atmosphere. And um, beryllium-7 is quite unique in that it has a, has a varying half-life, very slightly varying half-life, depending on the, the chemical compound that it's, uh, that it's contained within. This only applies to the K capture decay mode, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's still quite a unique uh, radionuclide out there. I don't know whether there are others that have been, that have been found in the last sort of 15 years or so since I stepped out of research that would also have um, slight variations in half-life through different chemical um, different chemical compounds. But this makes radioactivity extremely useful as traces in Earth sciences. Uh, if, uh, you know, because, because the, 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 uh, the lambda value is independent of physical chemical conditions generally, then we can do things like carbon dating. We can use uh, U238, uranium-238, thorium-230 to date volcanic rocks, where of course, as, you, as we all know, the, the temperatures and pressures involved in formation of rocks are, are massive, and yet because the, the, the decay constants don't get altered, we can uh, we can use the uh, relative variations of the activities of those nuclides to date those the volcanic rocks. Okay, so um, let's think. Let's begin to start thinking about the different modes of decay that. Um, and before we before I, I want to talk about decay chains where a radionuclide will decay to another radionuclide. Let's consider the most simplest form of radioactive decay, which is when a parent nuclide will decay to a stable uh, radioactive decay product. So uh, there are many, many um, situations and, and examples of this where this occurs. Um, and, and radioactive decay to stable products is common in, in, in lots of industries such as pharmaceutical, radiopharmaceuticals. Um, so carbon-14, for example, decays to nitrogen-14. Carbon-14 has got half-life of, um, oh, my brain's gone blank, blank. is it 5,760 years? Something of that order. Decays to nitrogen-14, which is stable, a stable, iso a stable um, uh, element, not isotope. There's no point in, in using a radionuclide in radiopharmaceutical research, particularly in drug development, that where the daughter product is radioactive because it can change the chemistry and the biochemistry 
of the compound quite significantly. So the fact that carbon-14 decays to stable nitrogen-14 makes it perfect as incorporation in drugs and uh, drug development in early uh, preclinical uh, trials of, 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 uh, of drugs that, that eventually make it to market. Phosphorus-32 is another example which um, which involves decay to a via beta to a stable uh, isotope sulfur 32. OK, so that's um, where we where we form stable decay products from radioactive to decay. What about where there is um, radioactive products produced from the parents and, and potentially um, the, a grand a parent daughter granddaughter sort of relationship, which be, is the beginnings of a decay chain. Well, like, also within nature in particular, there are many, many examples where this occurs. So you've got a parent, which is nuclide one, which decays to a daughter nuclide two, and obviously this can carry on and on right the way down a decay chain. So it's, if we depict it via this, where we've got one, this, this, this is the activity of nuclide one, which decays via the decay constant lambda one to nuclide two, and that decays via lambda two to lambda three, oh, sorry, to, to nuclide three, I should say. In, in those situations, the rate of decay of the daughter, in this case, uh, nuclide two, is the difference between uh, the rate, its rate of loss is decay to three, and its rate of production from, from its parent. Okay, and we can model that, or we can, we can calculate that, I should say, using this differential equation here, dn two, by dt equals n1 lambda 1 minus n2 lambda 2. OK, which is simply the change in, in um, number of atoms of, of, um, of nucleide 2 equals the activity of 1 minus the activity of, uh, of 2. OK, the rate of change in, in the activity of nucleide 2 is significantly impacted by the ratio of the decay constants lambda 1, lambda 2, and this starts us thinking about um, equilibrium processes that can occur in decay chains. So um, I, I want to look at, um, oh sorry, no I don't yet, we'll come on to that. So if we know the activity of the parent, nuclide one at time t equals naught, we can model the Dalton um, nuclide two activity, okay, using this equation. Now I'm not going to go into this at this stage because because I'm going to show you some examples in a minute, which 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 make will make a lot more sense of this equation. But just briefly, um, we've got the activity of nuclide two, uh, uh, obviously at time two at time t equals the activity of uh, nuclide one at time naught times this ratio of decay constants lambda two over lambda two minus lambda one times this exponential function here, um, which which I'll explain in in, in a minute plus uh, n2 at time naught. Well, this is the activity of, um, of nuclide two if there were some atoms there present at time t equals naught. The examples I'm gonna to give to you throughout this presentation assume there's no atoms of nuclide two present at time t naught, so that would be zero. So we'd be looking at this component of the, of the decay equation here. Okay, so let's consider some examples of um, of parent-daughter decay and ingrowth, initially considering this situation where we've got a parent that's got a half-life um, greater than its daughter, than its product. Okay, so the, let's consider the reactivity relationship between parent and daughter whose half-lives don't differ very much, but where lambda one is slightly less than lambda two i.e. the half-life of, of the parent is slightly longer but not massively longer than its daughter. Okay and, and a good example of two radionuclides that fit that category is our um, molybdenum, molybdenum 99 uh, which decays to uh, metastable 99m technetium. Okay those of you, well probably most of you actually are familiar with this with, the, with this radionuclide relationship and, and um, its use in the hospital um, sort of sex and medical sex and medical industry for, um, well, a, a molybdenum technetium generator where the technetium is taken from the generator um, and uh, injected into um, patients in hospitals to, to image parts of their body, image around the heart, for example. 
Um, the half-lives of the relative of, of these two radionuclides uh, differ not massively. So molybdenum's got half-life of six hours, sorry, 66, 66 hours, whereas technetium's uh, 99M's got a half-life of six hours. Okay, so there's 11 fold, sorry, 11 time, times different relationship in half-life there between the two nuclides. So if we calculate the decay constants for these radionuclides, then for lambda one, for molybdenum, the decay constant is this. Remember the decay constant is just log of two over the half-life. Because as I said, said earlier on, we, you know, I, it, it's general it's standard practice to, to convert the, the lambda value or, or calculate the lambda value in seconds to the minus one. Okay, so this is 66 uh, hours times 3,600 divided into the log of two. And that's uh, six times 3,600 seconds into the log of two for uh, the technetium decay constant. So let's consider this example that we've got a, a gigabecquerel of molybdenum, 99, and um, at, at, at time t equals naught, there's no technetium there. OK, zero. What will the activity of technetium 99M be after six hours? OK, which is 2.16 times 10 to the four seconds. Well, we can refer back to our equation here and, 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 and make that calculation. OK, so we know um, time, six hours. We know that the original activity at time naught of the parent is one gigabecquerel. We know the decay constant ratios. So that's lambda two over lambda two minus lambda one is 1.1. And we can calculate, of course, this for our value of T, remembering, of course, to convert T into the same unit as the decay constants, in this case, seconds. So that gives us 0.439. Multiply those together, gives us a product which is 0.482 gigabecquerels. OK, so within that six hour period, the technetium 99 ingrows to almost half the activity of the origin, original activity of the um, molybdenum 99. OK, so we could solve this equation, you know, I'm not knowing this is not by hand, but whack this equation into Excel and, and, and we can solve this from naught up to something like 600 hours and plot the and plot the decay um, sort of, and ingrowth um, activities. And that's what I've done here. Initially um, plotting just technetium 99M, we've got activity on the y axis uh, and uh, and time on the on the X up to uh, 650 or so hours. And you can see that, that as you'd expect, the technetium 99M, uh, I've not taken it back down to the origin, actually, it should it should come right back, back to naught naught. Uh, the activity in grows up to this point here, reaches the maximum, then follows what, what we would typically say is a classic decay, exponential decay relationship after that maximum point. If we plot um, molybdenum, uh, 99 on that graph. We uh, we obviously start off at t equals naught with a gigabecquerel, and we we just have that classic decay with a half life of 66 hours. Okay, but you'll you'll notice that uh, past this point here, which I should have marked with a dot on the graph. Actually, past that point there, the molybdenum activity actually decreases below the technetium 99 activity. Okay. Um, so up to that point, the activity of technetium 99 is less than molybdenum 99, but but um, from from t equals naught up to t equals let's say t equals t equals m, um, which is the maximum point at which the molybdenum uh, sorry the technetium starts to exceed um, the molybdenum, and and following that point there, up to infinity. The, the activity of uh, technetium 99M will exceed molybdenum 99M. OK, and this is what's called transient equilibrium. OK, which I think um, gets around, gets into people's heads and and causes immense confusion, not least in my head as well as part putting this talk together. I, I had to refresh my mind on, on transient equilibrium because it isn't something that we all have to consider that often. So how could you possibly create more activity uh, of, of technetium from molybdenum? Well, the, the reason why this happens is because of this uh, equation here, activity equals N times lambda. OK, our classic activity 
um, relationship between activity atoms and decay constant. So, so in the case of molybdenum uh, and technetium, the ratio of their half-life is 11. That's got a half-life of 66 hours. Technetium's got a half-life of six hours. Okay. Um, so, so a unit activity of molybdenum 99 will contain 11 times more atoms than the same unit activity of technetium, as as the, as this um, equation would would uh, would, would uh, calculate. So if you have a gigabecquerel of molybdenum, for example, that contains this many atoms. If you have a gigabecquerel of technetium, it contains 11 times lower or fewer atoms of technetium 99 m. OK, so we can we can calculate that from A equals N lambda. So transient equilibrium, I think, makes a lot more sense if you plot the number of atoms uh, against time rather than the activity against time. And this is what I've done here. This is the same relationship. This is saying that this is still the gigabecquerel of molybdenum and how it how the, the number of atoms reduces over time. And you can see it starts off around um, 3.4 times 10 to the 14 and decays down uh, classically following the from that exponential relationship. If I plot molybdenum, sorry, technetium on there, you can see that 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 we that we we get nowhere near the, the same number of atoms of, of, of uh, technetium compared to molybdenum. OK, and, and perhaps the best way of considering what's happening when the technetium activity exceeds the molybdenum is to plot the ratio of these atoms. OK, and what we see, and this is what I've done here, this is the ratio of the molybdenum atoms to the technetium, number of technetium atoms against time. And if you plot from a small periods of time, you know, from, from a few hours out, up to obviously 200 plus you see this relationship here and we know that the ratio ratio of half lives is 11 okay so when we exceed uh, sorry when the the the, the uh, ratio of molybdenum atoms to technetium atoms drops below 11 okay the activity of technetium will exceed molybdenum i mean that's exactly what happens at that point here that's our tm point on the previous activity graph which occurs around about 24 days in, sorry, 24 hours in, I should say. And after this point, it, it tends to one, uh, in which case, um, so it tends to 10, I should say, at which point um, the, the, the level of activity of technetium will always exceed the molybdenum. So that's the reason why we have transient equilibria. OK, so let's consider another example where the parent ha half-life is mu much, much more um, sorry, much longer than the daughter than the daughter half life. OK, so lambda one will be much, much less than lambda two. OK, and, and a good example of, of this relationship occurs in the at the top of the uranium 238 decay chain. So U238 decays to U234. OK, the half life of 238 uranium is 4.7 billion years and the half life of thorium is 24 days. That's a pretty significant variation in half-life, so it fits this relationship here. OK, so if we calculate the decay constants for these two uh, radionuclides, then it's 4.9 times 10 to the minus 18 second, seconds to the minus 1 for 238, and that for 234, thorium. OK, and, and let's, let's consider the same sort of relationship that we looked at with the molybdenum and technetium. So we start off with a gigabecquerel of the parent, nothing and no becquerels, zero becquerels of the daughter. Then what will the activity of thorium 234 be after 24 days? Well, using our equation again here, uh, we start off with our gigabecquerel. Our relationship there uh, of, like, between lambda 2 and lambda 1 is 1. And and, uh, and here, e to the minus one t minus e to the minus two t is 0 0.5. We're obviously starting off with no um, atoms uh, of thorium, so that's zero. So multiply those together, so it equals 0 0.5 gigabecquerels. OK, so um, what about after 48 days? So doubling doubling the time period. Well, that stays at one, that, that's unchanged. Uh, so the only change there is the t the t term within this part of the equation, and 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 we end up with 0.75. So so we get 0.75 gigabecquerels um, remaining after 48 days. Sorry, uh, ingrowing after 48 days. So the thorium 234 is ingrowing 
at a rate that's directly proportional to its half-life. And, and, and importantly, very importantly for this in-growth relationship, once T is much greater than the half-life of thorium, it will decay with the half-life of uranium-238. It will have reached uh, equilibrium with its parent. And we can we can have a look at this equation and see what that means in, at, at high values, high levels of T. So the, remember, the half-life of thorium is, two, is 24 days. So let's consider a case of you know, 1,000, 2,000 days, much, much higher um, T value compared to the half-life. So we can, we can strike out this because it's one and it will always be one. Um, we can also strike out E to the minus lambda 2T because that tends to zero as we have high values of T relative to the half-life of the radionuclide. So this tends to zero. So we end up with N1 lambda 1 times E to the minus 1T. We have no atoms of thorium-234 there at the start anyway. So we can strike all those out and we end up with N2 lambda 2 equals N1 at time naught lambda 1 e to the minus lambda 1t. That's our classic decay equation for a parent-daughter um, relationship. So you've got activity of nuclide 2 equals, equals the activity of nuclide 1 at time naught e to the minus lambda t. And, and, and that then explains why once t is large compared to the half-life, the, the activity of 234 thorium will ingrow at a rate that's, that's, that, that is proportional to the parent's half-life, not its own. And we can plot that graphically, uh, um, which I've done here. So this is 234 thorium activity across, uh, sorry, against the number of, of, of days of, from um, from ingrowth in from a one gigabecker um, U238 source. So you can see after 24 days, it's half, it, it's half of the um, parent activity after another half, like it's 7.75 or 75% of, I should say, and so on and so on. So it's an inverse decay relationship effectively. And to all intents and purposes over 500 days, the U238 is unchanged. It's got such a long half-life, the activity remains essentially the same albeit it has dropped very slightly, but not, but not by much. So that's the relationship that we have. And that's what, what's called secular equilibrium or secular equilibria. Um, the, the, the two radionuclides end up in, in, in absolute activity equilibrium and uh, the, the parent, the, sorry, the daughter decays with the half-life of its parent. OK, and then finally, in this sort of, of um, th these three processes that we need to consider when we're when we're looking at equilibrium, we have to think about what happens when a parent has a, a, um, a half life that is that, that is less than its daughter. OK, we've so far only considered the relationships where parents have a have significantly longer or slightly longer half lives than, their, than, the, than their decay products. In the case where um, where the activity of the daughter is, um, sorry, the half-life of the daughter is greater, then lambda one is greater than lambda two. Okay, and and because of this, um, the activity ratio increases and a permanent state of disequilibrium occurs. Okay, the, the two cannot ever reach a state of equilibrium. And that's easiest to understand again, considering a practical example and plotting the activities as I've done for the for the molybdenum and uranium um, relationships earlier on. So let's look at um, oops, let's look at polonium. Sorry, let's look at bismuth 210, which decays to polonium 210. The half life of bismuth 210 is five days, and the half life of polonium 210 is 138 uh, days. So there are the decay constants. And if we plot the, um, the bismuth activity beginning at uh, a gigabecker, well, again, I've not taken this up to zero, actually, it starts at one day, then it's a classic decay uh, with a five day half-life. If we plot polonium 210 on there, then you can see that it, it, it reaches no equilibrium state with the, um, with, with the bismuth 210. It, it does it does in grow, or it, it obviously is produced, but it's produced at a much lower activity over time because of that relationship between the two half-lives. So what about complex decay chains? Well, we've only really only considered so far simple um, daughter, uh, sort of parent-daughter relationships. What about the, when there are decay, decay chains where there are multiple decay products? 
and and this is where the, the sort of title of the talk came you know um and, and the reason why i was asked to do this came in, into play really it's it's um it, it's good old harry bateman and his and his um bateman equations which which uh, he formulated in in the early 20th century he took the work of ernest rutherford the decay chain model and produced I put in italics here simple. I don't think they are very simple, but 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 they are from a mathematical point of view really elegant and and simple. Really analytical solutions to Rutherford's decay model or decay chain model. And Bateman said basically, if we consider a decay chain that has um, lots and lots of nuclides in it, nuclide one being the parent, nuclide two being the immediate daughter, three, four, five, six, seven, down to M, and then eventually N. Uh, there can be any number of those decay products and we can model the uh, the level of activity um, of of n um, following the Bateman equations okay so if at time t equals naught then there are no atoms of uh, nuclides 2 up to nuclides n present then at any time after that point the number of atoms of nuclide n can be determined by this integral or the integral of this of the expression here dm dn for nuclide n by dt equals uh, the number of atoms of m the immediate parent times the decay constant of m minus n n decay constant of the of the daughter and we can integrate that um, to produce this equation here which is the classic bateman equation okay where's where where we've got oops what have i done um where we've got each of the decay, uh, each of the nuclides in the decay chain from one, two, through to M and then N, and then C1, C2 up to Cn are the dimensionless functions of the decay constants, okay, which are listed here. Now I have to take a bit of a step back and think, well, okay, this is getting complex now. We need we need some significant Excel programming to to you know to be able to complete these sort of calculations when we've got maybe 10, 12, 13 radionuclides in the decay chain. OK, and it is a complex um, process to do. You know, it can be done on paper, but, it, you know, it, it, it has to be done successively down the decay chain um, for each nuclide. Each nuclide successively becomes nuclide N, so you can calculate right the way through down to down to M and N. OK, I'm not going to do this in today's talk. It's way beyond the scope of this session, but I did want to point you this won't this won't be in the, um, the slides that are on the SRP website. So it's just for the for the live talk because we don't have copyright for it. But this um, decay chain relationship here is the solution of the Bateman equations for um, plutonium 241 that somebody's kindly um, put onto put onto the Internet in Wikipedia. And you can see plutonium 241 is this top line here. And, and that decays through an alpha to americium, sorry, through a beta, I should say, to americium 241, which has an alpha decay product, neptunium, which decays via alpha to uranium 233, and so on and so on and so on and so on. And over time, from naught to 100 years to 100,000 years, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Remember, this is a log scale um, on both X and Y. We can see the complex relationships between the parent, original parent, and the the nuclide, uh, sorry, the daughter and granddaughter nuclides that exist within that decay chain. Okay. Now I, I looked at this uh, when I when I got it off the internet, and, and plutonium two four one must plutonium two four one's got a half life of fourteen years, so this must this must be being produced continually in you know as as a as a parent. Otherwise, we'd we'd have seen the classic decay over a very short period of time relative to all of these other longer lived radionuclides. But you get the idea from this graph here that it's a pretty complex process. OK, so let's look at decay chains. Uh, this is the classic uranium 238 decay chain, the one that perhaps I'm most familiar with. And you can see looking at this, looking at all the radionuclides within this decay chain, that there's plenty of scope for secular equilibrium, transient equilibrium and disequilibrium. We've got a parent with a half-life of a few billion years, decaying to the daughter of 24 days. We've got other radionuclides with hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of years, a half-life. And then we've got short-lived radionuclides, minutes, seconds, days, and then years down the bottom for lead 210. So there's plenty of scope there. Okay, so let's think about geological 
um, two, three, uranium decay within geological materials, because that's, I think, a good, uh, it allows us to, 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 to consider each of the equilibrium phases that we've just looked at. So if we start at the head of the decay chain for your U238 in geological material, and we're going to make some rock today. So we're going to we're going to mix up a, a small amount of uranium, bump, um, add some silica, bake it in a hot oven. We're creating a, essentially an igneous rock um, with some uranium in it. Uh, and we'll do that today. And, and if we did that, then we would immediately start to ingrow the 234 thorium and the protactinium um, 234M. OK, that occurs immediately. OK, so within days, within a few days, we would expect to see equilibrium down to this nuclide here. But what happens below protactinium? Well, because we then find a, we then hit a, a nuclide that's got a much longer half-life than its immediate parents. OK, that depends on the ratio of the 234 uranium to 238 that we that we um, put into our rock. And um, those of you that are involved in the nuclear side or, or earth sciences will be familiar very much with the relationship or the abundance um, ratios for the uranium isotopes in nature. 99.274 um, of all uranium is, is 238 uranium. OK, and 0.005% is 234. This is by mass, not by activity. So if we have these ratios, um, in the in the uranium that we added into our rock, then we can translate that into into uh, activity. Okay. Now I've added in two, three, five uranium to this to, to this table here, um, just for completeness. But they're the mass abundance ratios for the different radioisotopes. Points uh, two, three, five uranium is 0.72 percent of all uranium. These are the half lives, so we can calculate the decay constants, of course. So um, and because we we know the mass abundances. We can calculate the number of moles that we would have of uh, of each of these isotopes in one gram of pure uranium simply by dividing the mass. In this case, for 238 uranium, one gram of uranium contains uh, 0.99274 grams of 238. If we divided that mass by the mass number, we have the number of moles. And we do that for each of the uh, radioisotopes. And uh, and then we can calculate the number of atoms from that with, of course, the number of moles times Avogadro's number. This is just you know, calculating the um, activity of uranium in natural material from first principles. Moles times Avogadro gives us the number of atoms. And then, of course, but we can calculate the activity by uh, multiplying the number of atoms by the decay constants for each of the nuclides. So you can see that one gram of pure uranium currently contains this, these, the, these activities of 238 to 234, they're essentially, they're not identical, but they're, they're as close as. Okay, so, so in our rock that we've just made, we, we, we have 238 and 234 at, at essentially at the same activities. Okay, so, uh, so they're in equilibrium. These would be in equilibrium within days of our rock being produced. So the next longest half-life in our decay chain is 7.5 times 10 to the 4 years, that's thorium-230, which means we then have to wait quite a few thousands of years for our rock to do anything else in terms of ingress. But within 10 to 15 half-lives of the 230 thorium, we would expect the activities to, to be equal here. OK, that's um, about a million years, 1.5 million years. And within 160, a further 160,000 years, we'd expect to see radium-226 essentially in equilibrium with the thorium-230. So, so we're creating an equilibrium process all the way down our decay chain. Now these these timescales, half, one and a half million years, down to a few tens of thousands of years, are, are minuscule from a geological perspective. So, um, and, and we know that from, you know, when we start considering the age of, of rocks. So the Cornish Granites, for example, are of, of the order of 280 million years old. The Peak District limestones are 350 million years. And the Scottish, I never quite know how to pronounce this, I think they're called Nices, uh, are 3,000 million years old. Uh, some of the oldest rocks in, in the world, in, in the northern, northern highlands, the Nice rocks. So, so, so it's minuscule. So we would, we would absolutely, the, the, sorry, these, time periods are minuscule compared to the age of the rock. So we would certainly have equilibrium within our 
um, within our natural rock all the way down through these nuclides to this point. OK, below a radium, then you end up um, speeding whole put the whole process up because we, 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 we then are into the into the part of the decay chain, which have mu has much shorter uh, half lives from radon 3.8 days through to microseconds to 214 polonium. OK, with the longest below radium, the longest lived radium cloud is led to 10, the half life of 22 years. OK, um, so because they've all got short half lives relative to the overall supporting parent, we, we expect to see equilibrium all the way down the decay chain. Well, not necessarily because of uh, radon emanation, and radon exhalation. Of course, we, we all, you know, the radon here is a gas, so it will have a tendency to advect uh, through advective and diffusion um, to leave the rock or the soil or pore spaces and um, and and create a sort of state of disequilibrium below it. Um, well, it's not disequilibrium; it will be in equilibrium below it, but it will be a, a, a rate that's proportional to the amount of radon that's lost. So if we if yeah, which is what I said here, the steady state equilibrium can and does develop below radon. But um, with the activities relative to radium being one times the ratio of the radon that is lost. So to put that into into practical terms, if we lose 30 percent of the radon from the rock, then the, the activity of the radium nuclides below radon would be um, one minus 0.3 times the radium activity. So they would they would tend to average around about 35 becquerels per kilogram to take, you know, compared to the 50 which is the radium, and that difference is the loss of radon out from the rock itself. OK, so we've got in our decay chain then equilibrium all in a natural rock. Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about a natural rock that's not been subject to chemical and physical processes where the elemental compositions might have changed. Um, but in a natural rock that's sat in the ground, not doing much for millions of years, we'll have equilibrium down to radon, we'll have some radon loss, and then below that we'd have an equilibrium that's proportional to the amount of radon that's been lost. So we can take that relationship and that our knowledge of equilibrium and disequilibrium in this decay chain and, and start applying it to real world examples. OK, so what if we work with uranium rich ores? Um, we need to understand that equilibrium in order to complete a suitable and sufficient risk assessment. OK, so let's think about um, a process where somebody's grinding up a uranium rich ore, what are the dose pathways that, that that person could be exposed to? Well, they very much depend on the equilibrium within the decay chain, but if we assume that it's secular all the way down, then then what are the what are the what are the risks? Well, the first, you know, starting at the top of the, the start starting at near the top of the decay chain, we, we mustn't ignore beta doses from protactinium. It's got it's got a um, beta max energy of 2.8 so 2.28 mega electron volts, which is the same as uh, yttrium 90. So that, that's a pretty pokey beta emitter and can create significant or can cause significant skin doses if we are in close proximity to, close proximity to a, a reasonably active uranium um, uh, um, source. It's got a half-life of 1.17 minutes, so it's, it's not it's not always, it's not often, but it's sometimes overlooked in the decay chain because people think, oh, it's it's gone, it's not there. But it is, of course, there because it's in equilibrium. Pretty much in all geological systems, well, in all geological systems, it will be in equilibrium with its parent two, three, two, three, four thorium and its its grandparent uranium two three eight. So we mustn't overlook protactinium. We've got gamma doses from the punchy gamma emitters at lead two fourteen, bismuth two fourteen. And of course, we've got inhalation ingestion doses from all of the particularly dominated by all of the alphas within our decay chain, 238, 234 uranium, 230 thorium and so on and so on. And the uh, potential doses from the betas as well. Just for completeness, just so it, those of those of you that know this decay chain very well, you'll notice I've left out 218 polonium. It's, it's, it's purely because the, the, the ICRP publications don't don't publish a dose coefficient for such a short lived radionuclide, but of course it will be in equilibrium. It will be causing doses. So so um, so we would have to consider it. So there's some committed effective dose coefficient for each of these radionuclides 
from 238 uranium down to 210 polonium, um, including the betas and gammas, which I've excluded from this uh, bullet point here, is 7.6 times 10 to the minus 5 sieverts per becquerel, which is a pretty significant dose coefficient. So much so that if somebody was to inhale only 14 becquerels of, um, of uranium-238 in secular equilibrium, their dose would be uh, a millisievert. Now that's that's a significant um, that's a significant issue for people that are working in very dusty um, uranium um, conditions. And just for just to add to this, this this dose here is dominated by 230 thorium. Half of more than half of the the overall dose comes from the 230. OK, but if we'd only have considered the inhalation or ingestion dose from 238, we would underestimate the committed effective dose by an order of magnitude if we didn't consider equilibrium in, the, in that process. OK, uranium salts. Uh, I'm going to whiz through this because I don't think it's so relevant, but I just wanted to add, add it here just to show you that elemental um, fractionation can cause um, changes in how we interpret decay chain equilibrium. So this, the, these salts are, um, are pictured here, uranyl acetate or uranyl nitrate. They're, they're elementally purified at the point of production, state of production, and um, they don't have anything um, other than uranium in, in from a radioactive perspective when they're made. But obviously, again, as soon as they're made, we start to ingrow these short lived daughters. The ratio between the 238 uranium and the 230 uranium can depend on, well, very much depends on the um, natural abundance ratio um, and whether the uranium that's being used as the as the um, as the primary source is depleted in 230 thorium or 234 uranium or not. Um, but just to consider this effectively, if we have um, a natural abundance ratio of these two isotopes here, we effectively only have the top four in the decay chain. And even if the salts are 50 years old, and we quite often do find radioactive salts in schools and universities and colleges around the country that are 30, 40 years old, they've sat in cupboards all that time. Even if they are 50 years old, you, you, you know, the thorium's hardly grown in at all. You do see a small component, but it's dominated by the top of the decay chain. So other examples of, of where ingrowth and decay is important, well, in waste legacies. So those of you that work with cyclotrons, you'll, you'll be absolutely familiar that, that um, targets can be neutron activated and, and, and become radioactive themselves. More often than not, the daughters in, you know, within the, um, um, within the um, activated target have short half-lives compared to the parent and you just get secular equilibrium in the target. Um, but it's important that we consider those daughters within our radioactive waste legacy and, and, and comparison against our permits, environmental permit limits. Waste disposals and environmental legacies are also really important um, when we make disposals um, from our premises. So for the example that, I, that, that I've looked at earlier, or we looked at earlier on with regard to the Bateman equations, plutonium-241, got a half-life of 14 years. Um, decays to longer lived radioisotopes, which are alpha, alpha emitters. Plutonium-241 is a reasonably innocuous beta, uh, beta emitter. Um, there's a committed effective dose coefficient for 241 plutonium. But if, which, which if we could ignore all of these daughters here, it's, it's not that, it's not massive. It's not a very significant um, CEDC. But when we start bringing in the daughters that might ingrow to small activities, um, the, the levels of risk increase by one to two orders of magnitude because of their alpha emission. OK, so we have to consider ingrowth in our environmental legacies that we leave um, following discharge um, or permitted discharge to the environment. So, of course, it's massively important ingrowth and decay in nuclear industry um, assessments of risk, both on site for on site storage and in the environmental legacy that the nuclear sites um, you know, leave when they discharge made up to material to the environment. We also have to consider um, environmental, um, sorry, we have to consider equilibrium when we think about out of scope and exempt levels within, within the legislation. So under UK law, um, certainly in, in England and Wales, the environmental permitting regulations set limits for 
full chain decay chain equilibrium concentrations, but also consider small sections of the decay chains that are outside of equilibrium as well. So, for example, for those of you that work in the norm industry uh, in the UK, the the, um, the 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 limit, the outer scope limit, the limit at which some some norm material is considered to be radioactive for uranium two three eight in a secular equilibrium is one becquerel per gram. Uh, but if if we only want to consider the top of the decay chain or we only consider the top of the decay chain because of some sort of chemical or physical process that we're involved in that strips out the bottom, then, um, for example, U238+, plus, which, which in, um, incorporates these nuclides here, 238 uranium to protactinium, the limit is five bex per gram. So we need to be familiar with the processes that we're involved in and how they impact on the, the um, equilibrium within our decay chain. Okay, normally it would be really rare to have 238 uranium without 234. There's, there's, there's extremely limited numbers of processes that would completely strip out the 234 uranium. It certainly wouldn't be a naturally occurring radioactive material that would result. Um, so, I, so I think you'd still have to consider the 234 in this relationship. Okay, so Chemical and physical effects can also impact massively on equilibrium within decay chains and, and, and actually solubility in, in particular um, is one of the biggest contributors to partitioning and decay chains and that affects dynamic environmental systems uh, massively, freshwater marine or atmospheric systems, it, it, you know, which are dynamic. They, secular equilibrium within those systems is very unlikely unless it's in the sedimentary or geological environment. And we can see that in the sea, in seawater, um, the relative solubility of uranium and thorium is such that uranium is more soluble. And we, we see greater concentrations of uranium in, in seawater, dissolved in seawater than we do thorium. Um, just as a, a completely unrelated point, well, it, it's completely irrelevant point for today's discussion, but. The relative solubility of, well, so, sorry, the, the average concentration of uranium in seawater is this, which means across the whole of the Earth's oceans, world's oceans, um, there are there's four billion tons of uranium dissolved in in solution, which is a you know when you think about it in those terms, it's an immense amount of uranium sat untapped effectively within the uh, uh, the world's oceans. Okay, so let's think about um, we can use chemical and physical um, extraction or, or um, effects on decay chains to um, to trace earth processes and this is some of the research that I was in, involved in so if we look at we're back at, with the uranium decay chain here um, and we're starting off looking at radon and the, and the associated radon decay products we all know that radon is exhaled, exhaled or emanates into the atmosphere okay but what does it do when it's in the atmosphere well um, more of our studies, RPAs, relate to the, the radon doses and, and the behaviour of radon inside. Radon effectively behaves exactly the same outside. It will attach onto, um, sorry, its decay products will attach onto smoke particles, dust particles in the atmosphere, and, and they'll be washed out gradually over time from the atmosphere um, or they're dry deposited onto surfaces. OK, in, in marine systems, and lake lake systems, the lead 210 that is um, part of that uh, decay chain um, is the longest lived component below lead, uh, below radium. That that lead 210, when it's rained out from the atmosphere or washed out from the atmosphere, gets incorporated into the particles in the water column of the lake or the sea, and they subsequently then settle out um, into the sediments underneath. Okay, so you end up getting a lead 210 component in sediments that is atmospherically derived. It, it originates from the radon that emanates from geological systems in, you know, well above the ocean surface or the sea surface. But gradually over time, as more and more sediments build up, the lead 210 um, decays away um, as, it, as it gets buried by newer sediments above it that have more lead 210 within, you know, within the um, uh, greater activity concentration because it's newer. OK, and we can use that profile of lead 210 in sediments in the marine environment to date, to, to actually date the sediments. And, and that's extremely useful in environmental um, research. So this is a project that I was involved in quite a few years ago now. This is um, Estuate Water in the Lake District, a pristine lake 
that has had no motorboat activity on it ever. Um, it, it motorboats are banned on the on Estuate. So the sediment record within Estuate water or underneath Estuate water is a really good indicator of of pollution levels, historical pollution levels that are, that, that are uh, more more wide, uh, further you know produce further afield. They're not uh, they're not necessarily so local localized production. And we took some sediment cores from um, from the from this uh, lake, and and I determined the lead two ten activity through that sediment profile, and and use that lead two ten um, those lead two ten concentrations to estimate the date of sedimentation, and we use that in pollution mapping. Okay, this is a, this is just a screen a, a shot of marine sediments actually, rather than the lake sediments. Um, again, a similar process could take place for marine sediment dating as well, but you know um, over you know, marine sediments don't deposit very quickly. So we're looking probably here at thousands of years worth of sedimentary record, which is way too long for lead 210 dating. This was why we were doing this work. We were looking at the, the profile of pollution polychlorinated biphenols within the lake sediments. Um, and and the, the, the co-chemists that were involved in this were, were looking at the PCBs. And they wanted me to, to tell them at which point in the profile the PCBs were deposited so that we could they could build up a, a time record of PCB pollution um, after the Industrial Revolution. Um, and it's an extremely useful uh, technique, lead 210 dating. I can't mention lead 210 dating without also talking about um, cesium 137. We can also use cesium 137 as a dating tool in sediments um, because, of course, Cesium 137 artificially produced within a nuclear as a nuclear fission waste product, and and this is the cesium ratio um, cesium profile we got from this lake, um, with the y-axis being depth depth from zero down to uh, ignore the unit, just think of it as centimeters. It's not quite, but it, let's think of it as centimeters, and then along the x we've got the cesium concentration from 0 to 300 bex per kilo. We got two peaks. Well one big one obvious peak and one not so obvious peak this is chernobyl de deposition which occurred nine, obviously 1986 so that gives us a profile at 1980 of 1986 around at that, at that point and then down here we've got a decay a partially decayed profile that occurred in the late in the mid 60s when there was significant or early 60s the significant atomic weapons testing of bombs it's been smoothed a little bit through sediment, um, sedimentary processes and decay, but it, it certainly allows us to benchmark 1986 there and maybe 1960, or well, certainly the 50s, 40s here, and then the 60s at this point. So we can use that as our comparative technique to look at, to, 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 to um, compare against our lead 210 records. And then finally, um, we're nearly there, um, contamination problems from from high radon concentrations, so equilibrium can also affect us um, in, in you know at, in, in unexpected ways actually. So this is a this is a, a luminized article from a, a jeep, 196 uh, sorry, a World War II jeep, and and a lot of museums and 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 facilities like that, include universities as well actually, have, have got a legacy of, of radium luminized articles, compasses, watches, clocks that are, are radium luminized. They might contain 10 kilobecs, 20, 30 kilobecquerels of, of radium, but most of them are not hermetically sealed, so they do leak radon. OK, so if somebody stores a lot of these in a small environment, radon levels can build up, so a low volume store or a cabinet, the radon levels can build up to significant concentrations. OK, and it's not unheard of, it's rare, but it's not unheard of to have to have concentrations that can be as high as a few tens of thousands of kilobecquerels per cubic meter, which is obviously way above the um, 400 bex, sorry, 300 bex per cubic meter that's now a UK legis legislative threshold for notification. Um, obviously, levels of radar at that concentration carry with it their own risk of, of inhalation, but, but I'm more concerned at part of today's talk really about identifying an area where, where which is often overlooked with radon uh, radium luminized dials and that's lead 210 okay so if you 
um, if you exhale the radon into the air, the, the radon exhales from the luminous articles and builds up in the air and decays through these short lived nuclides here and attaches onto walls and surfaces. OK, um, and you had a you have a significant potential contamination risk from these short lived radionuclides. OK. Um, but so I've lost my train of thought here. Um, yeah, if it's a closed system, um, then yeah, the levels can build up to, to quite high to quite high concentrations. But if we remove the radon source, if we take our radium luminized articles out of the store, then within a few uh, hours, or certainly a, few, a, a day or two, these contaminants here on the walls will have decayed away to zero because there's such short half lives and there's no more source of radon because the radon, the luminized articles have gone. So it's back to zero. So does that mean then we can we can work in our store without any concern? Well, no, it isn't. It, it doesn't mean this because there's potential for there to have been a small ingrowth, albeit a disequilibrium um, build up of lead 210 within that decay uh, environment. OK, so we mustn't ignore lead 210. So to consider this example, if we were to create an environment in a, a radioactive store containing these luminized articles and we just injected a one off concentration of radon uh, at 50,000 becquerels per cubic meter, then um, this would decay away. Let's say there's no other source of radon. Over that period of decay, we'll ingrow a small quantity of lead 210. 23 becquerels would be produced, which would then attach onto the walls uh, of the of the of the store. OK, um, but if we um, if we create a, an environment, sorry, I'm just thinking what I've got to say next. If we if we um, have our radioactive items it within the store continually so we don't remove them they're, they're in there for, for for years and years and years we we create a steady state equilibrium where the radon concentrations are are effectively reach an equilibrium in relation to their parents their parent i should say which is radium 226 so effectively the radon in the air will decay with a half-life of 1600 years it'll be it'll reach it will have reached that steady state equilibrium OK, so that, but what that will then mean is that the lead 210 will ingrow. Uh, and, and if the stores, um, you know, if the radioactive items are present in the store for many years, that can then create significant beta and alpha contamination legacies um, on surfaces. So as an example, after 22 years, the lead con you know, uh, within a store, which seems like a long period of time, but actually there are there are plenty of areas where stores, um, museum stores, for example, have had radioactive uh, luminized article, articles stored in there for, for decades. So after 22 years in this case, if we've got 50, if we've had an average concentration of 50,000 bex per cubic meter radon, then um, we would expect to see 25,000 becquerels per cubic meter of store volume of lead 210 present on surfaces. OK, the lead 210 is in growing, um, you know, relative to the radon. OK, and that would plate out onto surfaces and cause a significant contamination risk. And if only 10 percent of that radioactivity was inhaled, be it that's quite a significant proportion inhaled, the dose would be ten and a half millisieverts. Um, if it was ingested, it would be around about four to five uh, millisieverts. So we, we absolutely have to consider, um, albeit it's a disequilibrium relationship, but we have to consider the lead 210 in growth when we uh, have radon um, and radium luminized articles. We can't just think that the process is, is exclusively only short lived uh, days, minutes, seconds, um, half life isotopes, because if we do that, we, we neglect to consider the long term risks uh, for, for our storage. And that's pretty much it, all I all I wanted to talk about. To today, so I, I hope it's it, it's made some sense. I certainly wanted to um, to, to impart sort of several examples of of, of ingrowth, decay, equilibrium uh, relation, and decay and equilibrium relationships. I think to, in order to to, to um, you know for those of us who work in in, in with radium nuclides that are in complex um, decay chains, we need to have a good understanding of of the ingrowth and decay. Um, 
and and um, we also oops, have to also we also also have to consider and understand the chemical and physical processes that affect the day to day um, equilibria over time. We need both of those understanding of both of those, um, particularly for the long chain um, long chain rate nuclides. And, and that's me done, I think. Um, any, I, I hand back to Pete, I think, who's possibly going to ask um, any any questions. Thank you for.